With the UK now formally out of the European Union, you might have thought that the Brexit fun was over, but the most exciting part is still yet to come, the trade negotiations. While the UK and EU managed to come to some sort of agreement on withdrawal issues, including most notably citizens' rights and the Irish border, but an arrangement still needs to be reached for any future relationship. So in this video, we're going to discuss the future agreement and the kind of trade deal you can expect to see. If you haven't heard already, we started a Patreon account for TLDR EU, where you can support this channel and get great perks, including exclusive pin badges, early access to some of our videos, and thanks at the end of every single video. Also, we allow all $3 and up patrons to vote on the topics of the videos we make, and there's a poll up at the moment, so if you want your say, sign up now, there's a link in the description. Now many of you will rightfully asserted that we already have some sort of an agreement on the future relationship, in the form of the political declaration. Sadly, the political declaration isn't legally binding, and is only a common basis for the negotiations. But besides the basics which have already been agreed, both sides want very different things. And considering the EU have just published the draft mandate explaining what they want from negotiations, we thought it only right to take a look at exactly what the EU is looking for. The EU envisages the new partnership as a single package that comprises of three main components. General agreements on the likes of basic values and principles, as well as economic arrangements including provisions on trade and level playing field guarantees. And finally, security arrangements, the likes of law enforcement and judicial cooperation. While the mandate is quite detailed in certain places, in others, the detail is noticeably lacking. For example, on the topic of rail transport, it simply remarks that the envisaged partnership should address, if necessary, the specific situation of the Channel Tunnel. But some of the biggest revelations, and what will ultimately become some of the biggest stumbling blocks, are actually pretty detailed. So we're going to take a look at each major point in turn. The draft mandate affirms from the EU's perspective that they're prepared to conclude the negotiations during the current transition period. The Commission should aim to achieve as much as possible during the short time frame of the transition period, and should be ready to continue negotiations on any remaining issues after the end of the transition period. But it also continually states that there remains the possibility for the transition period to be extended, if the Joint Commission wishes, for up to one or two years. The draft mandate again makes clear that the EU wants to create a free trade area with no tariffs. That's if the UK agrees to a level playing field, a term the EU makes constant reference to throughout the mandate, no fewer than 14 times. Given the Union and United Kingdom's geographic proximity and economic interdependence, the envisaged partnership must ensure open and fair competition encompassing robust commitments to ensure a level playing field. But what does level playing field actually mean? Well, as the name suggests, a level playing field is meant to ensure that no player, in this case a country or company, has an unfair advantage when it comes to trading. In the context of Brexit negotiations, until the end of the transition period, the UK has access to the European single market, conditional on it accepting a common set of rules and standards on things ranging from safety standards to restrictions on state aid. The EU is clear that if the UK wants continued access to the European single market, they have to accept their rules. The EU argue that these commitments to a level playing field should prevent distortions of trade and unfair competitive advantages, based on an agreement that upholds common high standards in the areas of state aid, competition, state-owned enterprises, social and employment standards, environmental standards, climate change, and relevant tax matters. When it comes to movement of people, the draft mandate says that it wants to protect visa-free travel, saying that this travel should be based on non-discrimination between the Union member states and full reciprocity. It's worth noting that in April 2019, the EU came to a more substantive position on the issue, when it was agreed by the Council and European Parliament that following Brexit, UK citizens coming to the Schengen area for a short stay, equivalent to 90 in any 180 days, should be granted visa-free travel, on condition of reciprocity. Essentially, Brits will still be able to travel to the EU for short periods, as long as the UK allows Europeans the same access. 
As anyone who's been delayed for more than three hours on a European flight will know, the EU has additional rules when it comes to air travel that go beyond the industry default. Given the UK's proximity to the EU and the sheer number of flights between the UK and EU on a daily basis, the mandate makes clear that continued ease of travel ought to remain. The envisaged partnership should encompass on a reciprocal basis certain traffic rights to ensure continued connectivity. However, the mandate does make clear that the status quo cannot continue. The United Kingdom, as a non-member of the Union, cannot have the same rights and enjoy the same benefits as a member. Now, without getting too technical, airspace and aviation, like typical country borders, have a number of rules and freedoms. Five official ones, to be precise. That allows operators to do a number of things, ranging from flying over a territory and landing to refuel, to simply flying to another country and back. The fifth freedom, mentioned by the EU in their mandate, relates to the right for an airline to fly between two foreign countries on a flight, starting or ending in the airline's own country. For example, a flight from London via Paris, ultimately ending in Lisbon, where existing passengers are allowed to disembark and new passengers are allowed to embark. This isn't a right that all countries are granted, and post-Brexit, it's possible that UK airlines will lose these rights going forward. There's a huge amount of road transportation and haulage businesses between the UK and EU, and the mandate states that as third country operators, the United Kingdom road haulage operators should not be granted the same rights and benefits as those enjoyed by union road haulage operators. Any agreement reached by the UK and EU will not automatically also apply to the British Overseas Territory of Gibraltar, with the mandate stating, after the United Kingdom leaves the Union, Gibraltar will not be included in the territorial scope of the agreements to be concluded between the Union and the United Kingdom. However, this does not preclude the possibility to have separate agreements between the Union and the United Kingdom in respect of Gibraltar, and those separate agreements will require prior agreement from the Kingdom of Spain. When first discussed, this move was immediately rebuked by the Foreign Office, with the spokesperson saying that the United Kingdom will not exclude Gibraltar from our negotiations in relation to the future relationship with the EU. We negotiate on behalf of the whole UK family, which includes Gibraltar. Given the potential for immense debate on access to UK waters, the mandate is very clear. Besides cooperation on conservation, management and regulation, the objective of the provision on fisheries should be to uphold union fishing activities. In particular, it should aim to avoid economic dislocation for union fishermen that have traditionally fished in the United Kingdom waters. In essence, the EU wants continued access to UK waters for EU fishermen and women building on existing reciprocal access conditions, quota shares, and the traditional availability of the Union fleet, by providing continued reciprocal access for all relevant species, by Union and United Kingdom vessels, to the waters of the Union and the United Kingdom. Finally, when it comes to law enforcement, the EU makes clear that whilst the current situation cannot continue, it wishes for a close partnership where possible. The security partnership should provide for close law enforcement and judicial cooperation in relation to prevention, investigation, detection and prosecution of criminal offences. The security partnership should ensure reciprocity, preserve the autonomy of the Union's decision making and the integrity of its legal order to take account of the fact that a third country cannot enjoy the same rights and benefits as a member state. Any cooperation, however, is immediately predicated on the UK's continued adherence to the European Convention on Human Rights, with the mandate affirming that if the UK were to denounce the convention, then any cooperation between the UK and EU on security matters should be automatically terminated or suspended. Now all of this should be caveated with the point that this is just the EU's negotiating standpoint. Formal negotiations are expected to start up in a little less than a month, on the 3rd of March. But until then, we can only go on the signals and documents put out by the UK and EU. Regardless, you can count on us to keep you updated with any developments along the way, and what those developments ultimately mean for you. If you want more updates from us on this issue, as well as other EU matters, be sure to subscribe to the channel. You can also find us across all social networks simply by searching for TLDR News.
Special thanks to all of our Patreon backers who make these videos possible.